Looking out on the horizon, past the stout and well-defended walls of the port, past a few ancient trees and the rocky prominences that held outlying guard towers, I gazed for a long while at the green and gold sea, the waves not of water, but of endless grass, rolling over hills and great stretches of flat land as far as the eyes could see. This was the first time I'd ever seen the Shah. I'd heard a great deal about it, knew that it was far from empty and also home to countless unique creatures, including the fearsome Wemmick lion people, great tribes of centaurs, huge herds of grazing antelopes and buffalo, huge things called elephants and long-necked beasts called giraffes, packs of hunting dogs, hyenas, roving bands of gnolls, and something in between those last three. A creature the gate guards mentioned later that night when I sat in a tap room on a stout wooden bench nursing a glass of fresh water, and munching on some tough flatbread soaked in honey and spices that I dipped into a bowl of ground seeds and nuts, like it was a bowl of soup and the bread was buttery toast. The guard said this was a fearsome creature called a leucrota, which looked like some sort of dog from a distance, but closer up it was quite strange, with the predatory head of a badger, a very powerful jaw with a bite capable of crippling a man's leg and leaving a profusely bleeding wound and fractured thigh bone which immediately rang alarm bells in my head as I recalled the ferocious bite of the Oram Vorax I'd encountered at the foot of the Spine of the World Mountains in the far north many years ago. The Lucrota has a solid body with a long, flexible spine and a tail like that of a lion or blink dog with a tuft of fur at its very tip. The legs more like a mountain goat, cloven hooved and very nimble, but much faster, running almost as fast as a deer across open ground. While often afflicted with mange, their coat of fur has a ruff of hair on the shoulders and is patterned with some stripes that blend in perfectly with the grassland shadows as well as the dappled light in the sparse woods of the Shah. The guards said that close up, the creatures stank as bad as lions and tended to be infested with ticks, were no good for eating. Actually, they said only a vulture could stomach the meat and even they wouldn't touch the guts. I suspected the guards may have been exaggerating about that, but that was fairly minor compared to what they said next. The crota, they said, are intelligent predators, far more so than anything else one would call an animal out there on the Shah. They were more than just beasts, they were monsters, cruel and sadistic killers who tortured their prey and preferred to hunt down humanoids, it seemed more than anything else. Not only that, but their method of ambush was pure evil. Leaning forward over their communal bowl of nuts and seed, I offered to buy the guards a round of drinks if they would indulge me with as many tales of these creatures' activities as they could recall. Well, I was there all night, and it was almost sunrise before they started to run out of anecdotes about these creatures. And they were so consistent on some points, I have to assume them to be true. I doubt that Lucrota can turn invisible in tall grass, or that they drink the blood of children. But they certainly do target them, and use children as part of their insidious hunting tactics. Lucrota first appeared in the original Advanced Dungeons & Dragons Monster Manual. They've always had a hyena-like appearance and have recently been described as another creature associated with the demon lord Yenogu, along with the gnolls. And it's true, you do tend to find these two creatures in a loose sort of association with each other on the Shah and even beyond, with Lucrota extending their hunting territory far beyond the Shah in the same direction that bands of raiding gnolls have left a path of death and destruction. The Lucrota are not fussy about eating fresh meat and will gorge themselves on any humanoid carrion left behind in the Knoll's wake, very much like the Knolls did in distant times when Yunogu briefly brought horrendous, demonic murder to the world of Toril before he was sent back to the abyss once more. Lucrota are said to be more intelligent than your average Knoll, so I wonder which is more of a monster really? It may be that the Lucrota somehow direct the travel of the Knolls or scout for them or something. A match made in hell to be sure. I asked if any of the guards had actually seen one up close, and several had seen the body of one of them. They said it was nine feet long, and instead of fangs, it had sharp bony ridges in its jaw, with horrid smelling saliva that drooled from its mouth constantly. They are rife with disease. The hide has fairly nice fur if it were not so patchy and infested. The skin is a mix of brown, grey, and black. They have a tongue more like a dog than a big cat, long and pink, and their throat carries their most potent weapon a voice box as capable as a parrot, able to make all kinds of sounds, including human speech. One of the guards said that the ones who associate with gnolls can receive the gift of Yenogu, or perhaps there exist these things in the infernal plains, fully 30 feet long. It was told that they were disproportionate, with the neck and front part of the body much more muscular than the rest of them, 
without an ounce of fat on them, ghoulish, whip-thin and bony. You could tell one or more of them was close to a town or settlement on the Shah as the number of dead animals would increase dramatically, particularly dogs. And there were so many that Lucrota couldn't eat them all, just leaving piles of bloated corpses lying around, as noxious smelling as the Lucrota itself. Scavengers would shy away from them, aside from thick swarms of cackling vultures. Lucrota hunt every day, constantly. They are absolutely obsessed with finding, stalking, luring out and ambushing other creatures drawing out the kill for much longer than any normal animal predator would. They are sadistic and deliberately bully and torture their prey. They would approach a settlement of humanoids, targeting children if they can, and lure them away from the safety of numbers and houses and walls with their deceptive voice, imitating whatever sounds seem to attract children to them. Once they have a child, they will severely wound it, but not kill it immediately. Instead, they will both use the child to draw out adults and study the screams and cries of the savage child in order to better imitate those sounds itself in later hunts. They absolutely do play games, another sure sign of intelligence, but as you can imagine, their games are nothing less than pure evil. They only tend to attack isolated settlements and travelling parties far enough away from towns and such that backup is going to be too slow to arrive to pose a serious threat to the Lucrota. They know that humanoids, in sufficient numbers, are one of the most dangerous threats to their lives, along with creatures like griffins, manticores, wyverns and dragons. Also, they give the Wemmick a wide berth, as Wemmick simply love to kill Lucrota and have no use for them, just murder them as they imagine any with a shred of decency should. The guards gravely advised me, even though I was not going out into the Shah itself, but would rather be hugging the coast on my journey, that I should never talk to anyone I could not see out on the grasslands. In 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons, the Lucrota appears in Volo's Guide to Monsters on page 169. It's a challenge rating 3 large monstrosity that is chaotic evil and fairly dull in the stats department. It has dark vision out to 60 feet and a slight plus 2 bonus to deception and plus 3 to perception, but no bonus to stealth at all, which is just crazy. So absolutely give this creature advantage on all stealth checks made while it's in any sort of concealment in grass or woodlands. That's a no-brainer. It has an arm class of 14, thick hide, and 9d10 plus 18, or between 28 and 108, with an average of 67 hit points. That's a fairly huge range, so some can be youngsters or perhaps just really wretched and diseased, while some can be prowling grassland tanks. They have a plus 2 to initiative, finally a nod to them being ambush predators, and a speed of 50 feet per round. Though these creatures have nothing in their mythology or lore that states that they're fast or chase down their prey, they also give the Lucrota a kick attack, plus 6 to hit one target within 5 feet, inflicting 2d6 plus 4 bludgeoning damage and a special ability called Kicking Retreat, where if the Lucrota attacks with its hooves, it can take the disengage action as a bonus action. This is clearly inspired by the Ecology of the Lucrota article that appeared in issue 91 of Dragon Magazine back in November 1984. Thanks, Ed Greenwood, it's a good article. I'll get to the actual folklore and real-world history of these creatures in a moment, so you can see what I mean about this stack block being poorly researched. Anyway, they have got their mimicry ability, thankfully, so the Lucrota can mimic animal sounds and humanoid voices. A creature that hears these sounds can tell they are an imitation with a successful DC-14 Wisdom Insight skill check. They gave them a keen sense of smell, which grants advantage on wisdom checks for perception rolls involving smell, and they gave a nod to the demonic influence of Yunogu, which they heavily lean into with lore for these monsters. The Lucrota has the Rampage ability, exactly the same as the Knolls. So when the Lucrota reduces a creature to zero hit points with a melee attack on its turn, it can take a bonus action to move up to half its speed and attack with its hooves. Remember, zero hit points is not the same as death, so if you want to take a broader view, any time the Lucrota knocks a victim unconscious, they can do this. The bite attack should be the creature's go-to though, as you would expect, it's pretty severe. Plus 6 to hit one victim within 5 feet and inflicting 1d8 plus 4 piercing damage. However, if the Lucrota scores a critical hit, it rolls the damage dice 3 times instead of twice, reflecting the profound, crushing strength of its bite once it latches on. Each round the Lucrota can make 3 attacks, 2 with its hooves and 1 with bite. The attributes of the monstrosity are impressive. Strength of 18, dex and con of 14 and 15 respectively, wisdom of 12, intelligence of 9, and a charisma of 6, because 5th edition designers forgot that ugly monsters have high charisma because they're really, really intimidating. Particularly ones who can mimic the sound of a crying baby. Honestly, where is the horror here? 
It's completely absent. There's a dull collection of numbers that strips anything interesting away from this monster. So let's look at the lore included. And I quote, The Lucrota is so loathsome that only gnolls and others of its kind can stand to be around one for long. Its horrific hodgepodge body oozes a foul stench that pollutes anywhere the creature lairs. This reek is outdone only by the creature's breath, which issues from a maw that drips fluid corrupted with rot and digestive juices. In place of fangs, the Lucrota has bony ridges as hard as steel that can crush bones and lacerate flesh. These plates are so tough that a Lucrota can use them to peel away plate armor from the slain body of a knight. Does it have a stench aura like a troglodyte? No. Does it have any mechanics to indicate it's horrible to be near? No. The text does mention that Lucrota has tracks that look like a deer and that it lures its victim out by duplicating the call or vocal expressions of just about any creature it's heard. I think it's reasonable to give victims disadvantage on initiative if they've failed their insight check to see through the monster's deceptive voice. As for the links to Yunogu and Knolls, the text has this to say. The first Lucrotas came into being alongside the Knolls during Yunogu's rampages on the material plane. Some of the hyenas that ate Yunogu's kills went through different transformations rather than turning into Knolls. Among those bizarre results, Lucrotas were the most numerous. As clever as it is cruel, a Lucrota loves to deceive, torture, and kill. Because Lucrotas are smarter and tougher than most gnolls, one could occupy an elevated position within a gnoll tribe. Although a Lucrota is unlikely to lead a group of gnolls, it can influence the leader and it might even agree to carry a leader into battle and offer advice during the fight. So, in this case, they can fully speak. Gnolls see Lucrotas as a form of entertainment, partly because a Lucrota can mimic the squeals of a suffering victim a sound that always gives gnolls pleasure, even when no victims are to be had. Further, a gnoll is bloodthirsty and sadistic, but unable by its nature to prolong the fun of killing. They're too savage, they have to kill. Most Lucrotas are consciously cruel, to the point of being meticulous about their savagery to draw out a kill into better and longer sport. Gnolls enjoy watching Lucrota work almost as much as they like doing their own killing. That's all well and good. I approve of that lore, it's savage. It makes the intelligence and sadism of the Lucrota more its primary weapon. Okay, so real world history. Not something I normally expand on, but this monster is based entirely of ancient myths about hyenas. They were probably first mentioned by Pliny the Elder in his book Natural History, based clearly on the spotted hyena, who are actually named scientifically after the mythical beast that is based on them. Oddly enough, the word Lucrota was supposedly the name of a creature that was the result of when lions and hyenas mate, resulting in this accursed creature native to India, said to have red fur, the hooves and tail of a horse, and be the size of a donkey. A head that is a cross between a horse and a wolf, a neck that extends along its backbone so it has to turn its whole body, with red eyes, a mouth that stretches from ear to ear, and bony plates instead of teeth that snap together with a clacking sound not chewing things in that powerful mouth that can break anything, but rather swallowing it whole and letting the stomach chew it up. It's easy to see why the description of the high habits of hyena sound so monstrous. They do sometimes dig up the bodies of humans and eat them from graves. They can make vocalizations that sound weirdly human, along with their famous laughter-like barks. Pliny wrote that they lured shepherds outside by calling their name and then tore them to shreds. They could also make vomiting sounds that attracted the shepherd's dog, which they would also ambush and kill. And he also said that the dogs became mute if the shadow of the hyena fell over them. And any animal that the many colored eyes of the hyena looks at three times is paralyzed, unable to move. Many ancient fables and accounts talk about the belief that hyenas could change physical sex from male to female one year to the next. This is mentioned in Aesop's fables and the earlier writings of Ovid, as well as Pliny the Elder. This is an understandable confusion of facts, since female hyena have quite unusual genitals that do appear to be male. Isidore of Seville wrote in the 7th century that the hyena is said to have a stone called a hyena in the eyes that, when cut out and placed under a person's tongue, could grant a foretelling of the future. Taking all of this into account, could we give a Lucrota the power to slow a victim who meets its gaze and fails three saving throws? Could we allow it the innate spell-like ability to cast silence? Could we give it hardened cataracts in its eyes that grant divine portents for those who hold them under their tongue? Or perhaps could an alchemist extract foul body parts to brew a poison that inflicts confusing hallucinations that only seem to be prophetic to the victim? Clearly, if you are locating the canine humanoid lupin race in your campaign world or on the great Shah of Toral, 
they would be natural enemies of the Lucrota, as would blink dogs who share the same kind of tail as a Lucrota, which is probably just a coincidence. But what if the Lucrota are actually blink dogs that were horrifically mutated by Yunogu long ago? Always be ready to give that player who wants to study creatures something juicy for them to learn, and absolutely include the potential value such monsters have for alchemical purposes. Some additional ecological information. Most Lucrotas prefer to work in small groups of two to four with other Lucrota, though some also hunt alone. They do not possess names and identify each other by scent alone. Packs are their social unit and they mark their territory by leaving scent marks as a group so other Lucrota can tell how many members of another pack there are in any given area. Don't get me wrong though, the Lucrota tend to wander following food and although they like to frequent a territory they know well so as to readily escape pursuit, arrange ambushes and the like, they do not fight off other predators to defend such an area. They will leave it without hesitation if threatened by very strong foes, lack of food or natural disasters. They don't avoid working with other creatures who have strong interests in the things they enjoy, stalking, deception, torture and murder. They leave the door open for quite a few evil D&D monsters to work with. As you can imagine, Nagas and Lamias are a good choice and throw in some troglodytes just to chuck a curveball your players might not be expecting. Plus it covers that stench aspect really nicely. They live fewer years than humans do, probably the same as lions if it were not for the demonic influence. So in the wild, lions live about 15 years, up to 25 years in pampered captivity. Lucrota live perhaps 50 years at the most. Their offspring are called calves and they give birth to one or two at a time. The calves are black bear sized when born and born six months after mating, in full control of themselves. They follow their mother for at least four months, learning trickery and hunting skills and always go off on their own at the age of eight months or shortly before the mother is about to give birth again. During the first two months after giving birth, the mother goes into a killing frenzy to provide her offspring with plenty of food. The males stick around only while the female is pregnant and leave as soon as she gives birth. They don't mate for life and males can travel for miles and miles to find a new mate each season. The Crota have hardy constitutions and the climate the creature's habitat ranges from uh, subarctic to subtropical. On Faerun, the Lycrota can be found throughout the north as well as the steppes of Hatarbane in Vasa, the Dagger Hills in the Dale Lands and the Lonely Moor in the Western Heartlands and the coast of the Vilhon Reach in Chondath. Oh yes, a final thing. In older editions, Lucrota were able to collect gemstones, mostly to help lure victims into a treasure trap, but they do understand that humanoids in particular love gems and are willing to risk some obvious dangers to get them. Thanks for the viewer suggestion to cover Lucrota. My name is AJ Pickett, I make videos about RPG lore and monsters, and I'll be back with more for you very soon.